Good evening, panelists and guests. I am Rosemary Goodyear, a member of the Board of Directors of the San Diego Chapter of the Fulbright Association and host of the webinar, electing the president, the Electoral College, and the National Popular Vote. Thank you all for participating in the event. We will explore the voting method that is used to elect the president of the United States. In the 200 plus years that have passed since the framers of the Constitution selected this method to elect their president, this method has transitioned through changes, attempts to change this method through the addition of an amendment to the Constitution, as well as support Supreme Court decision. However, the Electoral College remains in place. Perhaps the most recent example of confusion related to the Electoral College occurred in 2016, the presidential election. The outcomes of this election brought about the question of the correctness of this method to be used to elect the president in the 21st century. This evening, we will hear information on how the framers arrived at their decision of the Electoral College. We will hear extended explanation of the Electoral College. And we will also hear about another method of selecting the president, the national popular vote. Further information in relation to this will proceed. And I, with my welcome to Will Jeshrello, who is also a board member of the San Diego chapter of Fulbright Association, who will moderate the panel and introduce the panelists. Next slide, please. Thank you, Rosemary. Before introducing the panelists, note that our Fulbright Association is nonprofit dedicated to fostering the exchange of ideas. And this panel will be recorded. To the American citizens, register and exercise your right to vote. Our four panelists are Mary Thompson and Ginny Brown, who are representatives from the League of Women Voters. Dr. McGowan is a professor of law from the University of San Diego, USD. And our final panelist is Derek Cressman, a political reform advocate. Mary will focus on the history related to the framers of the Constitution and bringing together the large and small states and how the president should be elected. Ginny will share some of the unintended outcomes of the Elector College as they evolved over the years. Professor McGowan will address the Elector College and how it evolved into today's election process. And finally, Derek Cressman, an advocate on legislative issues of campaign financing and voter registration, will present information on another option for electing the president known as the national popular vote and the compact states. At the completion of the presentations, we will have a Q&A session for approximately 30 minutes. Attendees may submit written questions via the Q&A feature anytime during the presentations. And the panelists who covered the topic may respond. If we run out of airtime and still have remaining questions, we will try to respond via email and answer your questions after the webinar. Rules of the panel are as follows. The first two panelists, Ms. Thompson and Ms. Brown, will have a total of, third, of 20 minutes to present their information. And then we will move to Professor McGowan and then finally Derek Cressman, who each have 15 minutes to present their topics. 
Mary, welcome. Thank you, Will. Next slide. For this discussion, my colleague Jeannie Brown and I represent the foundational history of the Electoral College. I'll provide some American history on why delegates in 1787 came to decisions on the method of electing the president. Jeannie will provide another evolution, the League of Women Voters study and position on the Electoral College today. Next slide. This famous image, which hangs in the Capitol Rotunda, depicts General George Washington resigning his commission as commander in chief of the Continental Army in 1783 at the end of the Revolutionary War. His voluntary action has been described as one of the nation's great acts of statesmanship. That transition, stepping away from power, sets the stage for our understanding of the transfer of power and the comedy that prevailed then. Next slide. As the Revolutionary War ended, the forces at play were not unlike the tensions we would recognize, massive national debt, rising taxes, a weak and dysfunctional Congress, states operating in their own self-interest, and unequal power among the states. The Articles of Confederation, which served as the country's first constitution, had two main goals. Preserve the independence of each state. Protect the sovereignty of the state. It was not strong enough to contain the problems facing the country. There was no executive, no judiciary, and the ever-present vulnerability to foreign intervention. Among all these factors, there was a real risk of domestic war among the states. That some states contributed to the war debt while others did not created serious hostility. Next slide. Shays' Rebellion in Massachusetts in 1787, an uprising by Revolutionary War veterans, now farmers, revolting due to rising taxes and foreclosures, served as a tipping point. The paranoia caused by this populist rebellion was enough to cause General Washington to come out of retirement. Coming to a head, after operating as a new nation under the creaky Articles of Confederation, a group met in Philadelphia with the express purpose of revising the articles, not to create a new constitution. Next slide. 55 delegates named by the legislatures of 12 states, Rhode Island refused to attend, met from May 25th to September 17th. On any given day, the mix of delegates and attendance varied, which affected the decisions and the discussions. Sessions were held in secret and little news leaked out. The group was undertaking something they were not authorized to do by the Continental Congress. The breakpoints became apparent and reflected the state of things in the fledgling nation. States' size, commerce, geography contributed to the breakpoints. Large states versus small states, northern states versus southern states. Common among these dividing points was slavery. A significant heated dispute formed around population size between large and small states which translated into representation under a new constitution. States with larger populations wanted congressional representation based on population, while smaller states demanded equal representation. Smaller states believed proportional representation would lead to dominance by larger states. Here, it's important to remember who attended the Constitutional Convention. They're mostly classical education and their familiarity with English Constitution. The original plan had been to have only one House of Congress, the Senate, similar to the Roman Senate. The disagreements about representation nearly brought an end to the convention. Delegates threatened to not approve the draft Constitution if their way did not prevail. Next slide. The solution came in the form of a compromise proposed by representatives Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut, a small state. The Great Compromise created two legislative bodies in Congress. It combined proposals from the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan, large state and small state respectively. There would be two national legislatures in Congress. Members of the House of Representatives would be allocated according to each state's population and elected by the people. In the Senate, 
each state would have two representatives regardless of state size and state legislatures would choose senators. States populations varied, but not by nearly as much as they do today. As a result, one of the main political effects of that compromise is that states with smaller populations have a disproportionately bigger voice in the nation's Congress. The agreement which created today's system of congressional representation now influences everything from Supreme Court nominations to the way votes are counted in the presidential elections. Next slide. According to constitutional scholar Akhil Amar, the standard electoral college story comes in two versions. One, the framers intricate presidential election system was a clever contraption counterbalancing large and small states. Or two, the electoral college scheme is proof that the framers abhorred democracy, the tyranny of a majority. Next slide. According to the Constitutional Center in Philadelphia, the fundamental agreements on how to elect a president were, did not want too strong of a president like a king, but needed more than a strong administrator. There were two schools of thought. Let Congress choose a president for one term, so say James Madison, spoken as a proceduralist, pondering how to structure a lawmaking institution. Some interpreted this as his distrust of the people to make this decision. Or two, the new sovereignty was the United States, not individual states. Let the sovereignty of the US decide, so say James Wilson, author of the words, we the people. The original intent of the Electoral College did not anticipate the rise of political parties, which eventually would group geographically distant citizens. The compromise result, the Electoral College, keep the president independent of Congress, candidates should be known to the electors who will represent them. As Alexander Hamilton stated in Federalist 68, electors should be a small number of persons selected by their fellow citizens who will be most likely to possess the information and discernment requisite to so complicated an investigation. There were other factors that contributed to the thinking about the selection of the electors. For example, information barriers, the distance, the lack of knowledge of people in the country that was so vast. Second, federalism. There was no sturdy national system in existence to administer an election. And then third, slavery. Wrestling with population and representation and the inherent differences caused by slavery's commerce and geography, the conclusion was to let the people decide their electors. Each elector would vote for two people. Next slide. After reaching this compromise, the actual process was hashed out. In theory, round one, large states would predictably dominate the qualifying round. But if no presidential candidate received an absolute majority of electoral votes in this qualifying heat, the presidential race would continue into a second round. There, the House, acting under a special one state, one vote rule, would choose among the top five candidates. The framers expected that after George Washington passed from the scene, electors would typically scatter their votes across a wide range of candidates, thus making round two the decisive event. Quote one delegate, George Mason from Virginia, 19 times in 20, the electors would likely fail to generate a first round majority winner. In fact, 19 out of 20 elections on average have been decided in the first heat. It was a moment in time. The process worked briefly. Electors voted for their top two candidates. The person receiving the most votes became president. The runner up was vice president. Unforeseen was the rise of political parties the Electoral College was not designed for that. In our discussion this evening, we'll hear how things unraveled. But first, to fast forward to this moment, Jeannie will share the League of Women Voters analysis of this creaky artifact, the Electoral College, and a view of how things could change. Thank you. Very thank you. Jeannie, welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mary. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan but political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. Today, I'll talk about how the Electoral College damages our democracy and how the League is working to abolish it in favor of a direct popular vote for electing the president. Next. We adopted this position in 1970 and most recently updated it in 2010. We also support the National Popular Vote Compact as a means to that end. I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Illinois for creating these slides. Next. So why does the League of Women Voters take the position to abolish the Electoral College? It's really very simple. It comes down to the concept of one person, one vote. For example, California's population is almost 68 times larger than Wyoming's, but it only gets about 13 times as many electors because the electors are based on the number of senators and representatives from each state. Another way of looking at this is in California, we have to share our representatives' attention with 712,000 other people, where in Wyoming, they share with around 125,000. It's much harder to be heard. Is this fair? As this map shows, the lighter the color, the weaker our voice is to our House members and to the elector who represents our vote for president. Next. Part of the League's core mission is to encourage the informed and active participation of the citizens in government. As such, Perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the Electoral College system is that it creates a disincentive to vote for citizens living in non-battleground states, which is the majority of our people in our country. If you live in California or Mississippi, why should you bother going out on a cold or rainy day to vote when you know your state's going to go blue or red anyway? The data from 2016 bears this out. In the graph, you can see the percentage of eligible voters who cast a vote for president was significantly lower in non-swing states compared to that of swing states. Next. The Electoral College decreases participation in our democracy, and this is bad for democracy. Next. Another significant negative factor of the Electoral College system is that it polarizes our elector and exaggerates our sense of being a divided nation, a nation of red versus blue. Did you know that in Alabama in 2016, 35% of the voters chose Hillary Clinton? Or that in California, 32% of those voters chose Donald Trump? That's a lot of people, not a fringe minority, but a significant portion of the population of the state. You look at these maps and all you see is red and blue, red and right and left, black and white. There are no centrists, there's no complicated middle ground. There's no reason to even talk to people in those other states because they're just too different from us. Their views are too extreme. So the map on the left with which we've all become so familiar is extremely damaging to our national unity and our ability to see the great variety of public opinions that exist everywhere and that deserve to be heard. Indeed, they need to be heard. So diverse population, uh, diverse opinions are as critical to, to democracy as the vote itself. While the map on the right is rarely shown, without the Electoral College, we wouldn't have to see our election results through this distorted lens. Next. So why do the re election results have to look like this? Two numbers, both very large, even in the most lopsided of victories. Remember Reagan versus Mondale in 1984? You may remember it as the most lopsided electoral college victory in modern history, which it was. 98% of the electors versus 2%. Next. But what you probably don't remember is that more than 37 million people voted for Mondale, 41% of the voters. That's not a trivial number. And it highlights the way the Electoral College simply erases the diversity of opinion in our democracy. Because when we see it through the Electoral College, 
Almost all of those so-called blue votes are utterly forgotten, erased. Where did all those Mondale voters go? They're just gone, they don't exist. All we can see is 525 to 13, the Electoral College outcome. Might we become more open to diverse, complicated opinions among our neighbors and fellow citizens, more willing to live among people who disagree with us? Imagine, instead of seeing ourselves as red or blue, we simply saw ourselves as Americans. So let's walk through a couple of the most common myths and mis misperceptions about what the Electoral College does and does not accomplish and how it's impacting our democracy. Next. By the way, these are not for just fringe theories. These are main points that supporters of the Electoral College use to defend this antiquated system. And none of them stands up to scrutiny. Myth number one, without the Electoral College, our presidents would all be chosen by a couple of big states like California, New York, and Texas. Well, let's run through the numbers to see how that would actually play out in an election by the national popular vote. Next, let's take, say for the sake of this example, that every state in the union voted 60% to 40% for the same candidate, an absolute landslide, an unbelievably strong preference for one candidate. And let's see how many states it would take to get us over the 50% threshold if we elected the president by the national popular vote total, going in order from the largest states down to the smallest. So California has the most voters and 60% of its voters would represent 7% of the national total. Next, next is Texas and then we'll add it to the total. Next is Florida and then next is New York, next Pennsylvania and now Illinois. And we're still not even halfway there. Let's add a half dozen more states and see where we get. Next, in fact, it would take the votes of 27 states to get us over the 50% threshold, even in this incredibly lopsided scenario of all those states voting 60% for the same candidate. In reality, of course, California and Texas might go for different candidates, in essence, canceling each other out. And the margins of victory would likely be much smaller than the 60 to 40 that we're talking about which means it would take even more states' votes to get us to 51%. And let's look specifically at California, where 30% of the voter, California voters went for Donald Trump. Once those states' votes were totaled, all four and a half million of those Trump voters were erased. Why should only a portion of a state's votes count when we elect the president for all the people? Next. Myth number two, smaller, less populated states need the protection of the Electoral College to ensure their interests are represented by the president. In fact, there is no coherent small state or large state interest that needs protecting by the Electoral College. Even the smallest state has substantial diversity within it. The concern of a farmer is likely to be very different than that of a computer programmer whether they live in New Hampshire, Nebraska, or any other state. Small states represent a great diversity of economic interests, and they share many of those interests with the large states. The great political battles of American history have been fought between opposing ideologies or economic interests, not between large states and small states. The numbers from the 2016 election show this emphatically. The smallest one third of states, those with fewer than six electoral votes, did not all go for the same candidate. In fact, they were exactly evenly split with eight going for Clinton, eight going for Trump. Small states do not vote as a bloc and they do not benefit from the electoral college. The same, the same goes for the large states as you can see. Next. In fact, smaller states are routinely ignored by presidential candidates under the current system. Instead, the candidates focus their time in the so-called swing states. That will decide the election. 19 states received all campaign visits from the two presidential candidates in 2008, virtually ignoring the other 31 states 
both large and small. So there's no basis for the myth that smaller, less populated states need the protection of the Electoral College to ensure their interests are represented. In fact, the Electoral College actually diminishes the rightful representation of the residents of larger and smaller states. Next. It is time to pass this amendment. Each presidential election brings this to people's attention. It has been proposed many times without success. That's why we look to the National Popular Vote Compact to make the Electoral College so powerless that no one will fight to keep it, and we can finally do away with it once and for all. Thank you. Jenny, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, Professor uh, McGowan, could you begin? Thank you. Good evening. I want to thank the Fulbright Association and UCSD for inviting me to participate in this event on the Electoral College and for organizing it. The title of my talk is The Electoral College, A Unique Failure. And I, I am calling it a unique failure because first, our process for electing our president is unique in the world. We are the only democratic country in the world to have adopted such a convoluted and anti-democratic process for selecting our head of state. I say that it is a failure, not because I personally would prefer a national popular vote to elect our president, but because it was a failure, a failure apparent to our founders as soon as the Electoral College became relevant to selecting the president. That was in 1796 when the first presidential election to choose a successor to George Washington took place. Serious efforts to reform the Electoral College began as soon as 1800. Now, Mary expertly laid out the purposes and reasons behind the founder's decision to institute an Electoral College. However, it became clear almost from the beginning that the Electoral College was meeting almost none of its goals, and that indeed, in some respects, it was undermining those goals. First of all, promoting deliberation by the electors, making sure that the wisest candidate would prevail. Well, by 1800, the electors had stopped deliberating and had become mere rubber stamps of the political parties that promoted them to electors. Second, it was intended to decrease partisanship and political gamesmanship. However, it was incredibly apparent by the mosh pit election of 1800 that the Electoral College actually magnified and fanned partisanship and political gamesmanship, and it continues to today. Third, the idea that the House would play a role in the selection of the president was initially viewed as a feature of the system. By 1800, when it was actually used to select a president, it was a disaster. And in, by 1824, when it was used for the second time to select a president, it was viewed with horror. Fourth, the Electoral College was intended to protect the interests of small states. But as Jeannie described for you, it does not actually do that. And indeed, perhaps it never did that at all. Certainly by 1836, when political gamesmanship and partisanship um, led nearly every state in the union to develop a winner-take-all system for selecting electors, the idea that small states would have much of a voice in the selection of the president was given the lie. Finally, the one thing that the Electoral College has succeeded at is to promote control over elections, over the qualifications necessary for someone to vote for president, has has actually remained viable. The Electoral College has done a wonderful job at doing that. However, 
today it is very hard to view that as a feature rather than as a flaw. So let's talk about how almost right out of the, out of the gate, the Electoral College um, is creating problems rather than solving problems. First, in 1796, John Adams is selected by the Electoral College, wins a majority in the Electoral College, and he becomes president. But because of the strange method of selecting a vice presidential candidate, that is, it just goes to the runner up, his arch nemesis, Thomas Jefferson, who's from the opposite party than him, John Adams was a Federalist, Thomas Jefferson was a Democratic Republican, Thomas Jefferson becomes Adams's vice president. Thomas Jefferson spends his four-year tenure as Adams's vice president, mainly at Monticello, organizing the Democratic Republicans' opposition to the Federalists and by extension to the Adams administration. So much for that. Second, in 1800, which fans of the Hamilton musical probably know all about, there was a huge problem with the election of Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. They tie in the Electoral College. That means that the decision over who would become president was thrown into the House. Instead of proving to be a, an easy decision or a straightforward decision to select the president, the House deadlocked, remained deadlocked, and this is in mid-February, remained deadlocked for days and weeks and does not actually determine that Thomas Jefferson will become president until only three weeks before uh, John Adams would cease being president. We had a constitutional crisis on our hands and it was barely averted only because of a partisan mosh pit. Um, Alexander Hamilton's loathing for John Adams led him to uh, encourage Federalists to throw their support behind Jefferson and to find a deciding vote for Jefferson. Now, in the wake of that, several constitutional amendments are proposed. One of them actually becomes the 12th Amendment. That was in order to, uh, that, that one was to cure the flaw that had been apparent in 1796. The idea that someone other than the president's toady or political friend would become vice president. Now, ironically, the 12th Amendment, which now has two votes, one for the president and one for the vice president, becomes a method for solidifying the importance of political parties. In order for um, that vote for president and for vice president to be coordinated, it becomes incredibly important that political parties organize at the state level and ensure that um, their party members, their, their members in the electoral college are actually voting as they ought to. There was also an effort to provide for a uniform method for selecting electors. It was recognized at this point that states were beginning to adopt different methods for electing electors, for appointing electors, and that that was being gamed by various states. In other words, depending on who, uh, who ran, what party had control over the state legislature, their method for selecting electors could change from election to election depending on the party's view of what method for elector selection could actually serve their interests best. Um, the problem was, oops, sorry. However, that ends up failing. The best method that the um, that political leaders who were thinking about things in a nonpartisan way um, thought that the um, Constitution should be amended was to promote greater democracy at the state level by having each state 
select electors by districts, much as how now we select members of the House of Representatives by district. That, however, failed in part because the Electoral College had become so politicized. Okay, then another disaster strikes, only 24 years after the 1800 mosh pit. In that year, John Quincy Adams becomes president over Andrew ja Jackson, even though he came in second in the Electoral College by quite a lot. He gains only 84 electors to Jackson's 99. And he also gets shellacked in, by Jackson in the popular vote. Jackson gets 41% of the popular vote, while John Quincy Adams gets a measly 31. Three candidates, the third, whom no one ever remembers anymore, uh, William Harris Crawford, are in the House, are sent to the House for, a for another contingent election. Um, and because of political machinations and because of some members of the House's loathing of Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, who has come in second in both the popular vote and the Electoral College, becomes president. Almost immediately, there's a hue and cry for major overhaul of the Electoral College, but that too fails. So we have this disaster. There is a cry by the, now the Democrats to overhaul the Electoral College, and yet even this disaster can't lead to major reform. However, what's interesting is, is that the idea of the national uh, popular vote becomes part of the debate for the first time, but in a backhanded way. Jackson, who is supposedly a big, or actually a small D Democrat, as well as being a big D Democrat, cannot get behind the national popular vote, cannot support the idea of a national popular vote because of the three-fifths clause and the advantage that slave states have in the Electoral College. Okay, now the failure of the reforms that were proposed in 1826 reveal the persisting impediments today, the things that keep us from becoming a more democratic system. First, our amendment system, our constitutional method for amending the Constitution has an exceptionally strong status quo bias. You have to get two thirds of the Senate, you have to get two thirds of the House, and then three quarters of states have to ratify it. And those of you who have been paying attention to the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, you know that it came within just one state of failing. So, 30, so three quarters of states is nearly impossible to get. And yeah. second, federalism. Because states have control over the method of election and voter qualifications, and like to have control over the method and election of voter qualifications, um, that itself becomes a break on change or a reason to vote against changes to the Electoral College. People continually fear, or this bugaboo is raised, that any changes to the Electoral College and the fact that states have um, complete discretion over setting voter qualifications for the election of electors um, raises concerns that changing the Electoral College will upset the balance between state and federal power. Third, the national popular vote is off the table because of slavery's entrenched three-fifths advantage in the Electoral College. Interestingly, post-Civil War and during the South's de de demolition of Reconstruction, that three-fifths advantage becomes transformed into a five-fifths advantage as, as the South gets the benefit of all of the African-American people that they disenfranchise between 1890 and 1965. Finally, then as now, support for reform depends entirely on whether a party believes that it is benefiting from the status quo or would benefit from change. Okay, so 
Here we are in 1970. Okay, so we have fast forwarded by almost 150 years. And that is the next time after 1826 that there was a major nearly successful or almost successful um, effort to reform the national popular vote, uh, nas sorry, the Electoral College. That, the idea that we should replace the Electoral College with the natural, national popular vote was led by rising concerns that the Electoral College could lead to the wrong result that hadn't happened since 1888, but some very close elections and the splintering of the Democratic Party with the Dixiecrats led to concerns that that could happen. Um, the, uh, the 1960 election made apparent that the Electoral College actually magnified the problem of voter fraud because it's easier to steal one state than it is to steal 50 states. And then the Civil Rights Act and Supreme Court decisions emphasize that one person should have one vote. And Supreme Court decisions um, uh, held that at-large voting schemes were unconstitutional under this one person, one vote principle. There is nothing more at large than the Electoral College. Finally, 81% of Americans favored the idea of a national popular vote to replace the Electoral College. So this reform where at least where the winner of the national popular vote, the a plurality winner of 40% will become president um, with an instant runoff passed the House overwhelmingly, 338 to 70. It's hard to imagine such a bipartisan, uh, a bipartisan uh, decision by the House today. It had extraordinary bipartisan support, even though most Southern representatives uh, who were Democrats were against. Feelings ran high, optimism ran high, that it would also get the two thirds necessary to pass the Senate. But then it failed. It ran up against the brick wall of Southern senators who were united in their opposition to reforming the Electoral College. Why? They continued to fear the participation of African Americans in our electoral process. Okay. They killed it through the most anti democratic process ever the filibuster. So then in 2000, the unthinkable happened. The Electoral College produced the disaster of Al Gore winning the popular vote and losing the Electoral College once the dust settled on contested ballots in Florida. And as we all know, the Electoral College was quickly kicked to the curb and we adopted the national popular vote right. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Indeed, in 2000, sorry, in 2001, Jimmy Carter, speaking as the co-chair of the Federal Commission on Electoral Reform, said this, it's a waste of time to talk about changing the Electoral College. I would predict that 200 years from now, we will still have the Electoral College. I suspect he's right. Thank you. Miranda, thank you. Uh, Derek? Thank you, Will. Um, uh, I, uh, Miranda's done a great job of talking about how the current system of the Electoral College and the winner-take-all method is not serving the purposes that the founders originally thought the Electoral College would do and all of these problems throughout our history. I want to highlight uh, two problems about how it is um, disserving us today uh, and then talk about the National Popular Vote Compact and how that can in fact uh, solve these problems that we're facing today. And I'll end on a side note of one side benefit that we can get uh, through enacting this plan. 
So if you look at the, the first slide of my presentation, it's similar to one of Jeannie's slides, and it's talking about how many times a presidential or vice presidential candidate is visiting the states during the key campaign month of September. So these are, stats are from this year. And um, you'll notice no visits to California. Um, and well, you may or may not care if a candidate actually comes to your state it's not in your city, you might not be able to, to attend anyhow. But what this is really indicative of is which states are candidates uh, caring about? Which states are they polling? Which states are they tailoring their campaign messages and platforms towards? And ultimately, which states uh, do they pay attention to when they are governing as president? So, you know, for example, I, I live in Sacramento and I spent about two or three weeks trapped inside my house uh, in the last couple of months because the air was unhealthy for me to breathe when I went outside. I'm also in a floodplain here in Sacramento. So I am highly concerned about the issues of climate change. And that's true of a lot of people on the West Coast in Oregon, Washington, California. But we don't hear a lot about that issue during presidential campaigns. And we don't see it as a key priority from presidents when they're elected because we are safe states. We're not getting these visits and we're not getting that priority. Instead, we hear a lot about fracking. Why? Look at Pennsylvania. You see 16 visits there because that is the swingiest of swing states and fracking is an important issue there. Similarly, the issue of Cuba is very important because there are a lot of Cuban Americans who live in uh, Florida or dairy subsidies or the role of dairy in uh, trade negotiations with other countries is highly important right now because of the key importance of a state like Wisconsin because it is so swing. Um, and you notice it's not because it's large or small or anything like that. New Hampshire's the only small state that's getting any attention from presidential candidates this year. So as we've seen, it isn't really serving the interests of small states anymore. It's simply serving the interests of swing states. And then if you go to the next slide, um, Miranda talked about this as, as the issue of the wrong winner becoming president when whichever candidate wins the most pat, uh, popular votes does not become president. And this has actually happened five times um, in our nation's history out of 45 elections. So that is really a stunningly high failure rate. And if we can go to the next slide, you can actually see those margins of victory, especially in 2016 and 2000. You know, 2016 was 2.8 million votes, 2000 more than half a million votes in the popular vote margin. And, um, you know, yet, the 2000 election was determined by 537 votes in the state of Florida because Florida was the key swing state in that year. So um, it's a, really an unfair system, both to voters and to whoever wins under these circumstances, because, you know, after all, that candidate has done their job. They've campaigned under the current set of rules and won under those set of rules but their presidency feels tainted and lacking the legitimacy and the mandate to govern that it would have if they were the winner of the national popular vote. So it turns out we can fix this. Um, and we can fix this through using the existing constitution where Article 2, Section 1 gives states the exclusive control over how they choose to award their electoral votes. And what it says precisely is that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. So states really could pick anyone. And originally, a lot of them didn't even bother having an election. They would just choose who they wanted to send to the Electoral College. States, you know, in the Bush v. Gore decision of 2000, the Supreme Court reminded us that the Florida legislature could have done that. And in fact, the Florida legislature was preparing to do that until the Bush v. Gore ruling made it unnecessary. We've even seen, uh, you know, discussions going on in the state of Pennsylvania right now where some Pennsylvania legislators are talking about that they may do that in this current election. And the Constitution does give them that authority, although there's a lot of legal dispute that they can't do that, changing the rules mid-process. But what we have seen is the evolution of this winner-take-all system that um, Miranda talked about, where most states have figured out they can maximize their own power by giving 
all of their electors to whoever comes in in first place in their state. Maine and Nebraska still aren't doing it that way. They are awarding theirs by congressional district. And that's why you, when you see those red and blue maps, sometimes you'll see them uh, with slanted diagonal lines. States could choose to give them proportionately. And some of our states do this during our presidential primaries, you'll notice, where if a candidate gets 15% of the vote, they get some delegates to their party's convention. But most have chosen this winner-take-all um, process, which is what is causing those problems I described. But once you realize that a state can do whatever it wants in choosing its own electors, you could see that a state could choose to give all of its electors to whoever wins the national popular vote getting the most votes in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia. But it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for one state, even a big one like California, to do that because we would just get ignored and candidates would campaign in the other 49 states and they would determine the outcome. But if there was a way for states to get together and say, hey, we're all going to do this, and it wouldn't actually even take all the states. All it would take would be states that control 270 electors in the Electoral College, because that is a majority. Um, and it turns out there is a very well-established way for states to make binding agreements um, to do something together. It's called an interstate compact. It's another provision in our Constitution. And the one that, that most folks in California might be familiar with is an interstate compact between California and Nevada for managing the watershed around Lake Tahoe. It's called the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. And the idea is to keep Tahoe blue through uh, managing the development and environmental impact all around that. And it is binding law on both sides of the border, on all the towns around the lake, on individual property owners, businesses, whatever. It's a way to pass a law that applies to both states. One of the more interesting compacts we have is for the Powerball lottery. And there's a gentleman named John Koza who actually invented the scratch off lottery ticket, he lives in Silicon Valley, very smart guy. And he'd also served as an elector uh, to the Electoral College. And he realized you could combine these two ideas and say, why not create an interstate compact where states agree jointly to give their votes uh, to the candidate who wins the most votes in all 50 states, but only once enough states have joined to guarantee that the winner of the national popular vote will become our president. And that is what's happened. And it's called the um, National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And if we look at the next slide, I would differ with Professor McGowan and say that nothing has happened. Because this movement, which began in 2006, and I, I worked on a thing when I was a, a staff person at Common Cause, has made a remarkable amount of progress in the past 14 years. Uh, we have 15 states plus the District of Columbia that have joined the National Popular Vote Compact, and those states um, control 196 electoral votes. Now, if you look at those green states on the map, they're the ones that have joined, and it includes small states like Vermont or Rhode Island or Hawaii, medium-sized states like Maryland or Colorado or Oregon, and a few large states like California or New York. So we can see this is an idea that's popular universally, regardless of the size of your state, um, because it's a way to make every vote matter, regardless of where you live. Now, if you look at the orange states, those are states where it has already passed one uh, chamber of the state's legislature. And those, uh, those states uh, comprise 88 uh, electoral college votes, and we only need 74 more electoral votes to join this plan before it goes into effect. So it is quite possible that either those own states or maybe a different one that hasn't passed it yet um, uh, could very well uh, enact this in the next four years, and the 2024 election could be held under the rules of the national popular vote. Um, 
th this has been, uh, you know, I, I personally participated in some of these debates. I've seen hundreds of hours of deliberation in state legislative chambers, and they get covered in local newspapers and national public radio stations. But because it has always felt like a somewhat distant idea, it hasn't received a lot of national TV network coverage or CNN or that sort of thing. But it's been a pretty remarkable and broad and bipartisan movement going on for more than a decade now. Um, let's go to the next slide, uh, which will show some resources if you want um, some additional information. And let me just point out um, one big side benefit of enacting um, this National Popular Vote Plan. And Professor McGowan touched on this as well. And that's um, whether you're concerned about the issue of fraud, I think. Where I may have gotten cut off um, is uh, I was on the, the last slide of my presentation with some resources there and talking about a side benefit of adopting the National Popular Vote Plan. Before um, I, I go back to that, let me remember to make one plug since we're talking about Fulbright scholars here um, who may love to continue reading more on this issue. There's a very lengthy book. Um, that you can get at the National Popular Vote website or at that website right there, Every Vote Equal. You can download a free PDF of it, um, or I think you can actually buy one uh, through a couple of different online things if you're really interested in learning more. But the side benefit I was talking about of adopting the National Popular Vote is it greatly diminishes um, the problems of fraud or voter suppression or just mistakes that we might see in our electoral process. So right now, 537 votes in Florida can determine who becomes our next president. And it is actually possible to see fraud at that scale. In, in 2018, there were almost 2,000 fraudulent ballots cast in a congressional election in North Carolina. Um, but to, to conduct either fraud or, or try to suppress people from voting at the scale that would be necessary to tip a national popular vote, you would need a half a million votes. Um, that's how close the 2000 election was, our closest um, presidential election in terms of the national popular vote in recent history. Much more difficult to carry out. Similarly, if you have a small problem like the butterfly ballot of Miami-Dade County in 2000, that can impact more than um, 537 votes. Or imagine one mail truck has a problem with it. it. It sounds crazy to say, but imagine 14 militia members, instead of deciding to kidnap a governor, decide to hijack a mail truck that could easily have more than 537 ballots in it. But try to do that for half a million ballots, that is a much more difficult proposition, easier to catch, easier to expose, easier to um, uh, prosecute. Um, and I should point out in that North Carolina example, they did catch even the 2000 level of fraud and prosecuted that person. Um, so uh, this is a side benefit of, of, of going to the national popular vote. And I'm, I'm personally experiencing it right now because I'm doing some work with people in Pennsylvania where that state has not figured out how to start counting their absentee ballots until uh, election day itself. Whereas states like here in California or Florida or Ohio we start processing those ballots days and weeks ahead of time. Um, and what that meant in the June primary in Pennsylvania is they didn't announce the winner of their primary races for 14 days after the election. So there are a lot of people worried that we could be in limbo this fall uh, for a week, maybe more, waiting for Pennsylvania to count their mail-in ballots because they just have an antiquated process that the legislature has not yet updated. Now, maybe this will fix that. Maybe Pennsylvania won't be the determining state in our election, but it's just an example of how our current system really can magnify an accidental problem or an intentional problem of malfeasance in a given state and affect the entire country. So, that to me is sort of the, the final kicker of why it makes so much sense to do this and why we've seen so much progress towards enacting the national popular vote. And why don't I wrap up and throw it back to you, uh, Will, to start taking some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Derek. And uh, thank you to all of the panelists for your uh, presentations. Now we will move to the Q&A session. I will read a question at a time 
and ask a panelist to respond. Um, first, Mary, what experience did the delegates have in the elections in their home states? Well, uh, they actually had quite a lot. Uh, even though uh, elections in British America were irregular and infrequent under the British Empire, um, in the spirit of revolution, the notion of uh, where annual elections end, tyranny begins, that took hold. So regular elections did become the practice. Um, we should remember that voting was largely by voice vote. Uh, there was no privacy of the ballot uh, uh, booth. Um, in um, in pre-19, excuse me, 1776, uh, the annual election of state legislatures was the main event. And there it was the idea to preserve the essence of uh, colonial assemblies uh, and rely on good local legislatures, uh, which helped to span the geographic and logistical difficulties that were inherent even in a state. Um, remember what travel was like. Um, there are a lot of examples of how various states, um, uh, Pennsylvania, 1776, even the militiamen, uh, they were unable to vote because of property requirements uh, for electing colonial legislators, but nevertheless voted for delegates to that state's constitutional convention. And then uh, in uh, Massachusetts, 1780, and New Hampshire, 1784, uh, they put their state constitutions to a direct vote of two thirds of the people. So there was quite a bit of experience with handling election and, and it, was, it was right in the fiber, uh, especially coming out of, of the British Empire that we want lots of elections regularly. Thank you. Ginny, currently do the geographical differences affect the Elector College? Not really. Um, you know, th there is a Southern, there is the Southern um, emphasis, um, but, but that is decreasing as the years go by. Um, again, the, the West used to be very re Republican and, and uh, but it, it is changing as people move around more, um, it is becoming less and less. So it used to be very strong, but uh, it is changing more and more. Thank you. Miranda. Why don't the pop with, with in a reason and in dealing with the, the recent 2016 election where the president got less of the popular votes and um, why then again and happened in 2000 as well. Why wasn't there a prompt serious calls for reforming or eliminating the electoral college. I want to I want to give a caveat. I think Derek is right that at the grassroots level there has been a, a heroic effort. Um, what Derek is describing is is really a Herculean and incredibly creative method to get around the problem of the status quo bias of the Constitution. But at the federal level, um, there has been no proposal to reform the Electoral College. So to actually amend the Constitution, that's a real dead letter. And I think it's a dead letter for a couple of reasons. One, I think swing states like being swing states. I think two, um, one of the funny things about the 2000 election in particular was that um, the way that the, that, that, Bush became president sort of took our eye off the ball that it was entirely the fault of the Electoral College that the 500 or 1,000 disputed ballots in Florida were even at issue. As Derek explained to us, you know, in a sea of hundreds, hundreds of millions of popular votes and in popular vote majority of over 500,000, it's, you know, we're talking very penny any stuff if we are focusing on, you know, 1,500 votes. The big decider, I think, in all of our minds of the 2000 election was the Supreme Court. 
and whether the Supreme Court played an illegitimate role in deciding whether Florida could continue to count its ballots past the time that there was a deadline set by Congress for the electors to meet and vote. And it was the Supreme Court's intervention that really caught our attention as opposed to where I think the blame really lies, which was dead at the feet of the Electoral College. So it's going to take a wonderful creative workaround like the National Popular Vote State Compact, I think, to ultimately bring democracy to uh, the, the election of the most powerful person in the world. Miranda, a little follow-up for me. Could that happen in 2020? Could what happen in 2020? That, that it would end up going to the Supreme Court because of one candidate might not agree? Um, I mean, certainly if we have a lot of contested, um, if we, certainly if we have a lot of contested ballots again, um, or if there are charge, charges of voter fraud, it certainly could end up in the Supreme Court. And that I think is one of the reasons why the Republicans, I mean, you know, the whole Electoral College, I think, has just distorted our political process in so many ways. One of the reasons why, though it's certainly not the only reason why, Amy Coney Barrett is being rammed through the Senate now, as opposed to in January when we have a new, new president, is because the fate of the election will rest on who holds a majority in the Supreme Court whether those are Republican appointed presidential, uh, sorry, Republican appointed justices or Democratic appointed justices. Thank you. Derek, do big cities decide everything? No, I, I, and um, you know, we can look at that through our own elections here in California, right? Like if we were to adopt the national popular vote, Rural votes would matter just as much as urban votes in the same way that Los Angeles doesn't determine who's going to be the governor of California. When the governor of California, you've got a campaign all over the state. I, I know personally because I, I ran for secretary of state in 2014 and traveled all over the state because that's what you do when every vote matters. You know, as Jeannie pointed out at the state level, you know, not everybody in Los Angeles is going to vote the same way, just like not everybody in Texas is going to vote the same way. Um, but even if they did, there is a real balance between uh, urban and rural voters in, right now in the United States of America. There are um, 59,492, 269, or 59,492,262 people that live in rural America which is just slightly less than the 59,849,888 people that live in our top 100 largest cities. Wow. So we, we need, what, what would happen under the national popular vote is we just thinking about people. Like nobody thinks about who won San Diego County versus Butte County when we elect the governor. We just think who got the most votes in California all across the same thing. And, and it would be just like that if we elected the president with the national popular vote. People would matter, geographic boundaries would not. Thank you, Derek. Mary, how did in the past did states elect a president or even at, at the governor level? Well, um, I'm going back to ancient history almost. Um, during the Articles of Confederation, and that would be prior to the US Constitution uh, being ratified, uh, often the president, um, and a lot of times uh, the executive of a state was called the president or a governor, they had almost interchangeable titles of a state. He was, and it was a he, was a delegate appointed to preside. Um, the delegates were sent um, uh, to, for example, the Confederation Convention with instructions, and they were paid by their states. They could be recalled if they didn't follow the instructions. This is interesting to think about in terms of electors um, being um, unfaithful. Uh, in some ways, in those days, it was thought of that an elector was like an ambassador to a country. They were basically assigned to a foreign country, and they had to do the bidding of those who sent them. Um, 
the state governors um, were uh, elected and appointed um, often sequentially or serially, uh, chaining terms of office into many years. Uh, for example, um, Connecticut's governor uh, repeatedly held office from 1769 to 1784. Um, New Jersey from 1776 to 1790. So some of the things that ultimately the founders dealt with at the convention were playing with some of these um, issues about the term of office and, um, you know, yes, how, how do we elect them? And what kind of mandate do they have once they're there? Are they an ambassador to be recalled or uh, are they independent actors? So a little different. Thank you. Ginny, if the Electoral College was meant to temper the populist extremes, has it done that? No, I think as I don't remember who said it, but it, it has become a rubber stamp. Um, it was supposed to, they, again, they, um, most of our founding fathers really didn't trust democracy, the Marlboro, the small d. Um, and so they thought that these would be wiser people, more in, um, informed people. Um, but that changed, I think it was uh, Miranda that, that showed how quickly that changed. And so it, um, it has not done that either. Thank you. Miranda, you noted earlier that race historically played a role in blocking the electoral college reform. Does race still play a role and impending any reforms of the electoral college? So yeah, I mean, I think it's I think that it's really important to recognize the the role that both slavery and white supremacy played in both instituting the electoral college and then in maintaining it um, and and squelching any discussion of it um, at least through 1970, and I think continues to to bias um, efforts against reform. Um, for those of you who who aren't totally up on your constitutional history, the three fifths clause that I averted to um, was a clause in Article One of the Constitution that said that all. Um, all representatives, a state's representation in the House of Representatives, uh, in the House of Representatives, would be apportioned according to the number of free citizens living in that state, along with three fifths of all other persons. And the framers were very clever and did not want slavery or the word slave or mm. slavery to stain our constitution. And so three-fifths of other persons was a really um, circuitous way of saying slaves. So Southern states got a huge bonus for perpetuating slavery. They got a bonus in the um, House of Representatives and because the Electoral College is based on the House of Representatives, slavery um, was built into the DNA of presidential elections. So when Reconstruction occurred after the Civil War, the 15th Amendment was finally passed in 1870. Now, I think one of the really weird things about our Constitution is, is that there is no federal constitutional right for a person to vote. This is very strange. What we have is we have two constitutional amendments that say that our right to vote cannot be abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, that's the 15th Amendment, or on account of sex, which is the 19th Amendment. But what that means, because we don't actually have federal constitutional protections for the right to vote, states have historically used other go-arounds, say for example, um, literacy requirements or the grandfather clause is of Southern states, which um, uh, if, if your grandfather was able to vote, then you could register to vote. Obviously, if you were an enslaved, if you were the descendant of an enslaved person post reconstruction, you were not going to be grandfathered in to being able to vote. That would be disenfranchising you. 
So states have historically, southern states have historically gone out of their way to come up with clever ways of disenfranchising non-whites. And they continue to do so. So Florida, which we all know is a huge battleground state, I don't think that it is at all an accident that the Republican controlled state legislature and the governor who is now a, who is also a Republican in Florida overturned and gutted a Florida state initiative, which would have restored the right to vote to millions of people who had served their sentences for felony convictions. That had, that, that would have restored the right to vote to millions of African-American voters. And as soon as that initiative became law in Florida, the Republican legislature ratified by the Republican governor of Florida gutted it and it remains gutted. So I think race continues to impede electoral reform and also to impede access to the ballot. Thank you. Um, we have a couple, couple, we still have some minutes and so we have some more questions. For example, and any of the panelists, please answer. Where do you see the stop is in changing this rule, the Electoral College? Clearly, most of the US population wants a popular vote. Is it the political parties that are stopping this and sending out false information? that eliminating the electoral, co electoral college would be bad. Um, any of the panelists take that one? Yeah, I, I can say two things, and then I bet other panelists have a bunch to say on this too. I think one of the things that, that I, I mentioned as a force against reform is that there are a lot of people in the United States who still continue to believe that our organization at the state level, at our citizenship as uh, as members of states continues to really matter a lot, that it is really important to limit federal control of states. I think we've seen this during the coronavirus on, on you know, really stark relief. And so I think that the idea that our federal system, right, our diversity of different states approaches to selecting electors would be replaced by a federal system of a national popular vote is um, anathema to a lot of people, just really gets people's, some people's hackles up. I think the second thing is, is that I think that the Republican Party now sees the Electoral College as to its advantage. I don't know whether this is true or not. Hmm. I don't think, I don't know whether this is actually factually true. But I think that Republicans, by and large, are not interested in electoral college reform. Um, and thus, um, Derek's map, I think, represents a lot of blue states who have signed on to the compact because they don't believe that they would actually benefit from, from reform. Thank you. I could just carry on, Will, yeah, please. Um, uh, on that first point, I think Miranda is right that there are a lot of legislators, especially Republicans, that are wary of granting any authority on any topic to the federal government. And that's precisely why a lot of them prefer the National Popular Vote Compact to a federal constitutional amendment. Because that compact leaves the federal government out of it. It, it is purely an agreement among states. And so philosophically, if you are a big proponent of state rights, um, that might comport more with that thinking. Um, and, you know, it was the case that in uh, 2004, John Kerry, you know, had, had um, you know, I think it was maybe 50 or 80,000 votes flipped in uh, Ohio. John Kerry would have become president despite losing the national popular vote by like 2 million. So this really could bite either party in the rear end, uh, you know, so to speak. And, and it happens to have... Uh, you know, turned on Republicans the last two times that it's happened, but there, that, that's not baked into the system in, in any shape or form. But to answer the, the question, though, what I will say, you know, having spent 30 years of my life working on structural democracy issues, it, it's not so much 
misinformation. It's just really hard to get both the public and legislators to pay attention to this stuff when they're worried about health care or coronavirus or child care or, or taxes or a million other things. And then even among all our democracy problems, as Miranda was talking about in Florida 2000, yeah, we had the Electoral College, but we also had hanging chats. So we had a big movement to fix election equipment. And we have the issue of spoilers by third parties. So there's a big movement for instant runoff voting. So we have a lot of problems and it requires a lot of effort to lift any one of them up to scale to actually get something done. And that's why this sort of been this, you know, 15 year slow burn on national popular vote that is starting to come to fruition. And I expect we'll hear a lot more about that um, in, in the coming four years, um, especially as it starts getting closer to coming to fruition when you only need two or three states more to do it. I think there'll be a lot of um, activity and discussion around this national popular vote plan. Thank you. And I'd also like to say that I think some of those myths that I talked about are still widely, widely uh, accepted. Okay. Um, Ginny, do the electors ever vote differently from where they pledged and do they, and can they have still do this? Uh, yes, in fact, <laughs> That's that's one of the big worries uh, that that um, we have here. Now, I, I imagine Miranda can can quote uh, which which years this has happened, but but there are quite a few that have um, gone completely against um, against what they have promised to do. It it really varies by state, um, and the Supreme Court just held this summer that states could prohibit electors from being. Um, from going rogue and voting their own consciences, <laughs> um, what, what's called as faithless electors. Now, if we're thinking about what Mary laid out as the um, deliberative process that was supposed to occur through the Electoral College and electors supposed to be able to vote their conscience and vote their judgment, it's incredibly ironic that that whole logic has been turned completely on its head. Thank you. Derek, um, is the national popular, national popular Vote Compact consistent with the Founding Fathers' intent, and does it matter today? Um, it, in one very important way, it is, in that it's leaving this issue of how to choose electors up to the states. And that was sort of the key compromise that the founders had, you know, um, as uh, we heard, some of them thought the legislature, uh, that the Congress should appoint, some thought we actually should have a national popular vote, some thought we should have a king. The compromise was, well, let's just leave it up to the states. And so the national popular vote is very consistent with that plan. And I think what, um, you know, Miranda's presentation showed us is, is the current system is absolutely not consistent with these ideas that they had. It was going to be some debating society that would serve as the primary and the House of Representatives would ultimately resolve things. Nobody wants that to happen anymore. So, um, you know, in many ways, I'd say the National Popular Vote Compact is consistent with that core compromise of leaving it up to the states and certainly um, more consistent with the original idea than, than what we've seen now with this winner-take-all rule being adopted willy-nilly. Let me just add something. Please do. That I, I think that the idea that the founders were universally shocked and appalled and worried about popular vote and against democracy is, is really overplayed. Um, James Madison, who was, you know, we call him the father of our Constitution, actually believed the popular vote would have been the most just and best way of electing the president. Um, I think that it was largely because of slavery and the three-fifths clause that it never seriously made it on the table. I mean, I think there are other reasons too, this, this whole idea that small states would get swamped by large states. But I, even though no one talked about it in terms of, we can't do this because of the three-fifths clause, I think that the reason why no one talked about it 
at, at the founding um, and instead went to the Electoral College or something like that was because of slavery. And I think it's, you know, the last thing that I want to say about this is, is that even if the founders were worried about democracy and worried about individual participation in the, in the election of the president, I don't think that that means that we have to be. Um, we really had a second founding with, the, with Reconstruction. The attitude towards voting and who can vote has undergone a revolution in the last 200, um, 200, I, 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 230, 40 years. Um, I have to go off my age because um, I was <laughs> eight when, when we, we celebrated uh, the, the bicentennial. We, we've had a re revolution in that. Hardly anyone could vote in 1789. If you didn't have property and you weren't a white guy, you couldn't vote. And that's simply not the case anymore. All of us who are over the age of 18 and a citizen are entitled to vote. So the idea that the framers were worried about us voting is really beside the point. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for speaking on the history and processes for electing the president this concludes the webinar panel, Electing the President, Electoral, Co Electoral College, and National Popular Vote. Again, thanks to Rosemary, panelists, alumni, grantees, and audience for making this event a success. Also, thank you to San Diego Chapter of Fulbright Association and UC San Diego Divisions of Global Education for enabling this event to happen, especially Debbie and her team who've, put, who've coordinated this and made this production possible. Again, kudos to Debbie and her team and to your staff. Good night to all.